Okay, so we have people joining the 3 p.m. Eastern panel on crime analysis and place-based interventions. Um, the first of two on this topic this afternoon here on stream three. Um, we have four papers today. Um, I've asked our presenters to, to stick pretty closely to the 10 minute rule, um, just so we have enough time at the end for um, any questions that you in attendance might have or that they may have for each other. Um, if you are an attendee in this, in this um, session, and uh, have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to post those in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, we will address all of those at the conclusion of all the talks. Um, so nobody came here to, to listen to me yammer on. So we're gonna go ahead and get started um, with our first um, paper today, the 168 hour crime week and underused analysis tool. Um, <clears throat> Andy, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Uh, okay, can everybody, oh, Andy, you can probably tell me, can you all hear me okay and see my uh, presentation? Yes, sir. Great, and I'll get started. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk today about a um, a a kind of descriptive way of looking at um, temporal um, crime. Um, and I'm going to just jump straight into it because of time. So um, just a quick overview. Unusually, I'm going to put in why I started thinking about this, because um, I kind of reflected back on why I do this. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to briefly talk about crime rhythm and crime concentrations. Um, not heavy on theory, just to kind of get us thinking about it. And I'm going to use two examples of the 168 hour crime week. Uh, one is violence with injury uh, and one is shoplifting. Uh, and then I'm going to look at what I think are kind of perhaps some next steps with this. Um, okay. So why did I start thinking about this? Um, and I know self-reflection is probably a dangerous thing, um, but, but how did I kind of come to start thinking about this? Um, I think in 2015, I put a paper together um, it was called Crime and the um, NTE, Nighttime Economy, around multi-classification crime hotspots, which were really poly-crime hotspots, I think. But I put in this figure looking at crime from kind of, if you can see the mouse, I'm not sure, from sort of Sunday morning um, through kind of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, for four different crime types, disorder, violence, drugs, and criminal damage. Um, and I kind of got more questions about this than I did on some of the place-based stuff. So I kind of started thinking, well, surely this is quite standard. Surely this is something that happened. But I realized over time that quite often when, when you see kind of journal articles, uh, crime reports, crime description stuff, you get this kind of, you know, crime by day of week, hour of day. These two are kind of, you see very frequently. And, you know, there's more crime at the weekends, which is actually in this uh, case study, there was kind of, peaks of crime sort of four or five, six o'clock and kind of um, midnight. Um, day of month, obviously we know the days of the month aren't equal and this kind of longitudinal, this is a kind of daily, but you could have a weekly. Um, and you see this kind of, particularly since COVID, you've seen a lot of kind of weekly longitudinals. I think, you know, that's okay, but I kind of think, you know, what does it actually tell us? Um, and I kind of got a bit frustrated. I have seen a couple of attempts of looking at the kind of one, six, eight hour crime week and I think you know that I haven't looked extensively there will be more examples but I found this paper from 93 Barry Pony wrote about design against crime and here we have 58 instances of crime and you can see this six o'clock in the morning till kind of six o'clock the following morning Monday to Friday and um, just a simple kind of tally uh, but visually that's quite a useful way of thinking about you know this was almost 30 years ago um, more recently there was this paper um, on, uh, on the pandemic by Dixon and Adamson and Nick Tilly around crime on the rail network in England and, and Wales and possibly Scotland. So it looks at kind of, you can see the day of the week and the kind of hours in this kind of circle. And, and I think that's useful, but I think it still doesn't quite, um, quite show the kind, of, the, the kind of weekly frequency because you kind of, it's hard to compare Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday visually. So th there are efforts out there. I haven't looked extensively, but I kind of, um, I kind of start thinking, well, actually, you know, how useful is this 168 hour week? Um, so just thinking kind of a bit about it in more detail and sort of crime rhythm, tempo and concentration. Um, you know, we know about crime concentrates 
we've seen lots of literature about how it concentrates in individuals and the idea of, you know, there's lots and lots of studies on repeat victimization, near repeats, et cetera, et cetera. There's been a lot of them on uh, place and concentrations by place. Um, you know, David Weisberg's law of concentrations, just the kind of latest iteration of a number of these sort of micro paced studies. And this paper I talked about, the, um, uh, the MCC paper, you can see kind of really real kind of similarities between the four crime types spatially. But in terms of concentrations of crime, I think there's just, they're not not looked at, but I just don't, I think our focus has moved away from when these hotspots are and when these crimes are happening. And I'm not saying it's not there, but it's, I think the focus has moved away from this. And I, and, and I think it's it's important to refocus it a little bit. Um, so Amos Hawley and um, Lawrence Cohen and Felsen's routine activities talked about this explicitly. They talked about rhythm, they talked about tempo, and they talked about timing. Okay, so the regular periods in which events occur, the rhythm, the tempo is around the number of events per unit of time. And this is the kind of the frustration I had about those, you know, crimes by day of week or um, hour of day, that kind of tempo. Lots of what we do temporally is this tempo. And timing, I think we struggle to do this in terms of how victims and offenders coordinate their activities and come together. So I've kind of, this is really for another paper this timing, but I'm just kind of thinking about rhythm and tempo, actually, how we start to visualize rhythm and tempo. Um, so why the 168 hour crime week? Well, it, it's kind of what we know. It's we live lots of our our, our lives by by the week, right? We start work on a Monday, we try and finish work on a Friday. People often used to get paid weekly. Um, lots of our activities are kind of function. We we understand the week. So so actually, why don't we think about crime in that kind of weekly kind of basis? You know, 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, so this is for a 2017 uh, anonymized police force uh, in England and Wales. Um, you can see on the bottom, we start Sunday at six o'clock, move through 9, 12, 3, 6 p.m. through to midnight and then the same. So we have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And you can see actually when you look at all crime types, then this is takes out cyber and fraud, but most crime types. Um, the peaks are actually generally Sunday to Thursday around about six, seven, nine o'clock. And um, there's these clear peaks at kind of midnight on, on Friday and Saturday. So um, so I think this 168 hour kind of description is actually really quite useful um, to think about from a descriptive point of view. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna look at it for a couple of these crime types. What I've got is I've just kind of simplified it to um, a two point moving average. So the, the peaks uh, might be slightly off, but you can see you know, there's actually quite a distinct peak on a Saturday. There's kind of a dual peak on Fridays and the weeks are much more um, earlier. The weekdays are kind of much earlier in the day and they're kind of a single peak. So, so there's something different going on that I think we need to think about. Um, how does it vary by different time types, crime types, sorry. Um, so here we have um, violence with injury um, and you can see a real distinct weekend pattern here. You have sort of midnight Friday, midnight Saturday. There is an issue, I think, with the data here that I need to check, but you know, the the, the, the dual peaks on a Sunday, um, and actually on kind of Tuesday, when you have some more dual peaks, these dual peaks here, but there's a real different pattern going on. And I think actually, to me, that intuitively makes sense just to look visually in a very simple way. Compare that with shoplifting. Um, here you can see the frequencies. So actually, um, shoplifting is quite stable. Um, throughout the week, it kind of has a single peak around about three o'clock on most days. Um, and actually, the, the volumes are quite steady as well compared to violence with person. And you can see this shift of, of violence with injury to later in the day. So just by looking at these two crime types, you can sort of think about this um, in quite a simple way. Um, I wondered about this kind of seasonally. Um, I broke it down just because it was easy to do by quarter. So this is by the first 13 weeks of the year, the second 13 weeks, etc. cetera. Um, so the first quarter, you can see this probably includes New Year's Eve um, from kind of midnight onwards on the 1st of January. But this is the kind of first quarter. Um, when you move into the second quarter, you can see as it gets lighter, we have some, some kind of increases sort of earlier in, in the evening, sort of three o'clock, sort of six o'clock, seven o'clock, the, the violence pattern starts to change. Um, third quarter and the fourth quarter, which probably picks up on, on Christmas Eve here as well. 
Um, so probably the quarters weren't great. Um, but there is fair, can fairly consistent patterns for most of this, um, for, for this. So I thought I'd see more seasonality than I did. And it might be around the, the kind of the, the windows I chose, but I think it's a useful way of looking at it. Just finally, if I think about concentrations, and obviously you can do a, a Lorenz curve, but um, this is a resource target table. These are the hourly windows. So Saturday midnight, this is just a one hour window. There were 300 offences across the year. That's 2% of offences, 2% um, of cumulative offences. So we can see um, you rank these in order. So the fir these first kind of 14 hours, 20% of all your offences in about 8% of your time period. So. 20% of offences across about 8% of the week. Um, actually, they're quite close to Friday, Saturday evenings, as we know. Um, what surprised me a bit was the when you come further down this table, it's not really an 80-20 rule, it's about an 80-60 rule. And actually, no, our window had no offences. So even the low ones had six, seven, eight. So across the year, all of these 168 hours had an offence of, of, of violence at some time. So it's not as spatially concentrated as temporally concentrated as it would be spatially. So just to wrap up and think about next steps, I think this is a useful building block for temporal analysis. Um, what unit do we use? What's the sensitivity? If we think about the place-based stuff and we have, do we have a 100 grid, a 250 meter grid? What's our window for temporal? Well, how do we look at seasonality and holidays? Trying to move towards a combination of tempo and rhythm a bit more. And I think 168 is useful. Maybe some circular statistics and meaningful clusters. And I haven't talked about limitations of recorded crime. I use the from time. Well, obviously, you've got a from and a to time, and, and that issues around the heuristic stuff. Um, and if you get really small numbers, if you merge this one six eight window with very small places, so there are issues here. But I just wanted to flag it as an idea that I quite like. Um, there's a couple of papers that I've talked about that since I put this presentation together. Um, I'm going to just um, flag them really, just because people who are watching this back on the video can have a look at them. Um, but that's really it for me. Thank you for your time. And um, I think we're taking forward questions at the end. So thank you very much. And I'll hand back to Andy. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next paper is mapping the bias of police records. Um, whomever is taking the lead, lead on this one, David D'Angelo. Um, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, thank you very much for organizing this conference, first of all. It's been great and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. So this is a paper that I've done with Angelo Moretti, who's also also here, and Sam Langton from, from Leeds, with some funding from the Manchester Statistical Society. So basically, we wanted to analyze the figure of crime and that we all know it's a problem for, for crime mapping and see if the dark figure of crime generates like, uh, or the risk of the dark figure of crime is worse when we aggregate crimes at very small levels of geography at micro places uh, in comparison with larger spatial scales that maybe are less uh, problematic. So that's the main problem that we're trying to analyze here. Um, the paper is now under review, but we're happy to share the paper in move if you're interested. In the presentation, we will introduce the problem um, we know that we have bias in, in crime data. We will uh, discuss some of the sources of this bias and, and uh, how it can change across different geographies. Our research question, data and methods. And uh, as you will see, this is a simulation study that we illustrate with some real world data. So we will present the results of the simulation study and some conclusions finally. Um, so as you all know, we all use police data. Police data is used by police forces to design and evaluate crime prevention strategies, but also by policymakers to, to design policies at the different geographical scales at the, the national level, but also uh, at the local level. And it's also used by academics to develop theories of crime and deviance. So it's quite important to make sure that when, you, when we use police data and this police data is not biased, and it's actually showing the actual representation or the actual visualization of each geography of crime, right? Uh, but we also know 
that that's not the case. We also know that police recorded crime is affected by bias um, that affects the figure of crime. And this dark figure of crime changes by the victim's willingness to report crimes to the police that we, don't, we know changes by the sex of the victim, age of the victim, ethnicity of the victim, et cetera. We all know that. We also know that the police control over areas is different. So the police uh, controls some areas more than others, and therefore the, the likelihood to witness, police, uh, to witness crimes when they are happening also changes between, between areas. And also um, there are different counting rules that can affect some police forces or police administrations more, more than others. However, this doesn't need to be a problem if the dark figure of crime is the same in every single area, right? So if we know that 70% of crimes are unknown to the police in every single geographical area, when we produce maps of police recorded crimes, the visualization or map that we will obtain would be the same that we would obtain if we knew every single crime happening in society. But that's not the case, right? But the question that we're trying to solve here is, is this problem larger when we produce crime, when we produce maps of crime at the level of very detailed levels of geography? So since we, since the 80s and 90s, we criminologists are producing maps of crime at more and more detailed um, geographies. And um, now we are doing maps of crime at the level of micro places, but we actually don't know what are the implications of producing this type of, of, of maps of crime in terms of the dark figure of crime. Um, so our hypothesis here is that very small levels of geography are defined by very socially homogeneous communities while larger levels of geography will be much more heterogeneous in terms of the social characteristics of population. Then um, the dark figure of crime is more likely to vary across very small geographies than across uh, neighborhoods or community areas, for instance. Um, so this is the research question of our, of our paper. Are crime maps produced at the smaller, more socially homogeneous and spatial scales at a larger risk of bias than maps produced at larger, probably more socially heterogeneous uh, scales. And our hypothesis is that, yeah, they are, right? The risk of bias goes larger when we produce maps of crime at micro places for micro places. So um, since we don't know every single crime that happens in society, the only way for us to answer this question is using synthetic data sets of crime like a simulation study. Our simulation study is divided in four steps that I will explain very briefly here, um, but we don't have much time. So if some of you have some questions, I can answer them later. The first step is we access data from the census, which is aggregated at the level of output areas, which are very small levels of geography here in, in England and Wales. And we obtain empirical parameters of the age distribution sex distribution, income distribution, education distribution, and ethnicity distribution for every single of those small areas. Then using those parameters, we generate a synthetic population of UK residents or England and Wales residents that uh, replicates the actual population in every single area for England and Wales. Then using uh, parameters obtained in the crime study for England and Wales, um, we will estimate how many crimes have been suffered by every single person in our synthetic population. How do we do that? And we estimate negative binomial regression models of, of four different types of crime in the crime study for England Wales. Violent crime, resident crime, and property crime, and vehicle crimes. We're using the same independent variables that we have generated before in step one. Then this will allow us to obtain regression parameters that we will use to simulate crime victimization in our synthetic population, also following a negative binomial regression model that we assume uh, is the distribution that crime follows in, in this case. Then in, in step three, what we want to know is whether each of the crimes that we have simulated in step two is or not known to the police. And we follow a similar procedure as in step two. We feed uh, logistic regression in this case because we only have two outcomes 
either it's either each crime is known to the police or not known to the police. So we estimate a logistic regression model um, of crimes being known to the police in the crime area for England and Wales. And uh, using again, the same independent variables at, that we had generated in step one, uh, we obtain model parameters and we simulate whether each crime in our data set is known to the police or not. And then we do the same to simulate if each of those crimes took place in the local area where victims live or not. And we remove all crimes that did not take place in the local area. And this is to prevent ourselves from producing maps of area victimization rates instead of area offense rates. Uh, it is, we wanted to produce maps where, like, of places where crimes happen, not only places where victims live, which is which, what the Crime Sorry for England Wales is designed for. So we ended up with a sample of more than 300,000 crimes uh, across 1,530 output areas, which are small geographies in the city of Manchester. Then we aggregated them in larger scales, which are lower super output areas, middle super output areas, and, and worse. And we evaluated this, this population using parameters from the real crime data recorded in Manchester from the police. Then what we did is calculate the relative difference and the relative bias between all crimes and those crimes that are known to the police in our, in our synthetic population. And we do this using the traditional formula to, to compute the relative difference and relativize it. And also, uh, we also calculated the relative bias. I only have one minute and a half more. So this table summarizes the main results of the simulation study. This is the difference between all crimes and crimes known to the police and average across all areas in each level of geography. Output areas are very small geographies, words are larger geographies. So first of all, we say that the average doesn't change. So the average, that figure of crime doesn't change regardless of which level of your geography we choose. What changes is the variance and the standard deviation, right? When we choose uh, smaller levels of geography, the difference in the dark figure of crime between areas becomes larger. Um, and also here uh, in the bias, while when we choose larger levels of geography, the difference between the dark figure of crime between areas becomes smaller. And the conclusion of this is that maps produce uh, the level of neighborhoods, for instance, from police data will show a similar visualization to mass produce if we knew uh, every single crime that happens in society. This is another way to visualize it um, using box plots for all these types of crime at the different scales of geography. This is again, and the difference between all crimes and crimes known to the police in each of, the, of these areas. So each point is one area in the city of Manchester. So when we aggregate crimes at the level of, yeah, one minute, right, Andy? Uh, less than that. So if you could, if you could wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is another way of, of showing it using a map in the case of property crimes. When we map the dark figure of crime at the level of very small geographies, the difference between areas is very, very large. Whereas when we map the dark figure of crime at larger spatial scales, both, most areas have similar levels of dark figure of crime. Therefore, aggregating crime, crimes known to police at very detailed levels of analysis increases the risk of inaccurate maps, um, while maps of police recorded crimes produced at the neighborhood and ward levels show a more accurate image of the geography of crime. This, of course, has limitations. Our simulation study and captures area victimization rates, not like rather than area offense rates, which is a limitation. And um, the crime salary for England Wales does not record data about victimless crimes and homicides, work, of course. So our preprint is openly available for anyone to access and also all the codes just here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, our next paper is the influence of elevation and slope on the incidence of residential burglaries. Um, Natalie, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Sosa Ortiz. I'm a doctoral student at um, in the Criminal Justice Department, International Crime and Justice Program at Florence National University. Um, so thank you all very much for being here in attendance and for hosting this presentation today. Um, this is the project that I'm currently working on, and it's entitled The Influence of Elevation and Slope on the Incidence of Residential Burglaries. So first and foremost, why is it even important to understand how elevation and slope influence crime? Well, it's important for a variety of reasons. Um, these two geographical features are largely understudied in the field of environmental criminology, but there's evidence to suggest that, they're, that they are very good at predicting certain crime types. Um, first and foremost, they help to inform policing practices. So if certain crimes at certain elevations and slopes um, are found to have certain patterns with specific crime types, then it can help with the development of situational crime prevention techniques and the allocation of police resources. In addition, it can help to identify um, crime patterns to help police departments and other agencies predict future behaviors. And lastly, it has theoretical implications. For example, um, the least effort principle or the least effort theory uh, suggests that when an offender is given multiple alternatives for, for how to behave in a particular situation that they're gonna pick the pass of least resistance essentially. So um, that's, a, so that's tied into here, especially for slope. The, the hint here is that um, if they were given two options, right? One path that was flat and one that was at a steeper incline, they are more inclined to choose the path that is flat as opposed to steep. So there's very limited um, studies that have incorporated slope and elevation and their relationship with crime. But here are a few examples. To date, there's no general consensus on how elevation and slope affect a variety of crime types. And that's partially attributed to the fact that um, the units of analysis in each study is different. Um, the research methods that they employ are different. For example, some study crimes that occur at the street block level, others at the neighborhood level, um, and others in the suburbs and such. Uh, the geographies are also largely different. Uh, some studies have been conducted, for example, in Cincinnati, uh, Seoul, and South Africa. So again, there's no clear relationship between um, slope and elevation and variety of crimes. So these are the theories that are going to be informing my particular study. We have the rational choice theory, which assumes that offenders will make rational decisions, right? They engage in a cost benefit analysis to determine whether they'll commit a crime or not. The routine activity theory, which says that victimization is likely to occur when um, a motivated offender and a suitable target converge in the absence of a capable guardian. And as I mentioned before, the least effort principle um, when they're given two alternatives for a course of action, they're going to choose the path of least resistance. So there are several gaps in the previous research. For example, as I said, there's limited research that investigates the relationship between geographical factors in crime. A lot of the environmental criminology research uh, emphasizes things such as um, state non-stationary variables such as weather, temperature, climate, uh, environmental design, building design, and things like that, but not necessarily the influence of the physical terrain on crime. Uh, moreover, the influence of slope and elevation, especially at the micro level in analysis and for specific crime types, is not clearly understood. Uh, for that reason, I chose the block uh, unit of analysis for my study, and I'm um, studying specifically residential burglaries. And finally, a lot of the research conducted um, before on slope and elevation focus on geographic areas that are less hilly. So for that reason, I chose the um, city of San Francisco as the area of emphasis in my study. Number one reason is because it's the number one hilliest city in the United States and the second most hilliest city in the world. Um, this study is also advantageous because it examines factors that can explain block-to-block -block variability for the specific crime of residential burglary. And it also examines how the environment and crime relationship uh, exists for specific land use type, right? So there's different types of land, residential, commercial, and industrial, but this one spo uh, specifically focuses on crime events that occur in residential areas. So these are my research questions. Um, are street blocks in San Francisco with higher average elevations more likely to experience residential burglaries? Um, my hypothesis is um, 
that there's a negative association between elevation and the incidence of residential burglaries, such that um, areas that have higher elevations will experience less um, burglaries. Um, there's a, con a conflicting explanation for this that says that um, it's probably more advantageous for crime events to occur at higher elevated areas because of the vantage point that it offers. Um, but we'll see how it plays out. I believe that it'll be a, ne a negative association. The second research question is, are street blocks in San Francisco with steeper slopes more likely to experience residential burglaries? And again, this one's informed by the least effort principle. So I am supposing that um, there's going to also be an inverse relationship, whereas uh, street blocks that are steeper, like have a, a larger gradient, are going to experience less residential burglaries because of the effort involved and um, the difficulty, for example, in offenders escaping. So my data sources, um, I got the bulk of my information from the Data SF website. Um, the residential burglaries that I've extracted come from the police department incident reports. There are 7,465 incidents in my study and uh, other variables that I'm including involve elevation contours from that website as well, um, transportation networks and the zoning districts to separate the land into different types. And I also have sociodemographic variables that were extracted from the US Census website. So this map here um, separates the land of San Francisco into different types, residential, industrial, commercial, and public. You can see they're color coded here. Um, so my area of emphasis is the residential lands here, uh, because again, I'm studying residential burglary. So all the areas that are in pink are places where, um, where opportunities for crimes to be committed for residential burglaries. They all have dwellings in those particular areas. This map is also, um, it's illustrating the relationship between elevation and residential burglaries. So as you can see on the left side, as the colors become darker, um, these are higher elevated areas that you see toward the center here. This is a very hilly aspect of San Francisco. That's where Twin Hills are and such. So the elevation can get as high as 800 feet. And on the right hand side, this is um, the number of residential burglaries. So as it gets closer to the shade of red, the more residential burglary incidents that occurred in that particular block. Um, so from a superficial scan, um, it doesn't appear that there is a very clear relationship between elevation and residential burglaries. We do see a uh, concentration here in the northeast corner, which is near the commercial district in San Francisco, and a larger uh, incidence here in the southeastern corner of San Francisco. So the variables in my study, um, the independent variables are elevation and slope. The elevation is going to be computed by um, getting the average slope per block. Um, and the slope is also computed by taking the difference uh, per block in elevation and dividing that by the length of the street block. So it's like a, a rise over run. Um, again, the dependent variable is the number of residential burglaries per block. And these are the uh, variables that I'll be holding constant in my study. As far as my analysis plan, I'm gonna be conducting a negative binomial regression uh, analysis on this. And of course, this is more appropriate to use when you're using count outcomes and your independent variables are continuous. Um, so I made this determination because I found that in my data set there was evidence of over dispersion. Uh, of course, that means when the variance is, is greater than the mean. And my KS test was statistically significant, indicating that negative binomial regression would be a better um, form of analysis than a Poisson. And uh, lastly, there are a few limitations of this study. Uh, because it is conducted specifically in the city of San Francisco, the generalizability of the results of this study are questionable. Um, in addition, these burglary cases are aggregated at the block level, so we're not quite sure how these trends would differ in um, more aggregated levels of analysis, like the neighborhood level or census, um, things like that. Um, there's also a lack of a standardized measure for how to compute slope. Um, other researchers have used techniques such as studying um, the variance or the standard deviation of mean for their particular units of analysis. So there's not an official um, method of how to compute slope at this point. And finally, my study does not distinguish between different types of residents. So um, we can't see how these the relationship specifically between elevation and slope differs for different types of dwellings, such as apartments and homes and um, lofts and flats and such. So. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Natalie. Um, our final paper 
uh, in the session this afternoon is Eyes on the Street. Um, Shannon and John, um, whenever you're ready, um, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, we're good to go. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yes, uh, my name is Shannon Linning. I'm from Simon Fraser University. Uh, I'm presenting today an upcoming book that I just finished writing with my co-author, John Eck, who is also here on the panel today. Um, it's entitled, Whose Eyes on the Street Control Crime at Places and in Neighborhoods? New Answers from Jane Jacobs. So the overall gist of this book, I can't change my slide. Here we go. Um, is that we challenge much of what we know in terms of crime control and the perspectives used to understand neighborhood crime in the traditional criminological literature. I think we've all been told about the Chicago School and how it explains city growth and neighborhood change. Uh, you see Park and Burgess here likening that process to this sort of natural ecological one of invasion and succession. Um, but as we found in a lot of our research and those of um, others in criminology, the problem with this is that it's often not reflective of what we actually see uh, in cities and how neighborhoods actually change. Um, and this came from a lot of work that we had been doing in some urban neighborhoods in Cincinnati where the explanations in traditional crim theories were not accounting for the things we were seeing. And as we looked elsewhere in the literature in other fields such as urban planning uh, and economics and, and business, a lot of people were looking to Jane Jacobs and especially her book, Death and Life of Great American Cities. And one thing that's interesting about this, we actually picked her book up and read for ourselves. And we found overwhelmingly that criminologists typically misinterpret what Jane Jacobs talks about. Um, her famous term, eyes on the street, is often interpreted as meaning the eyes of residents within these neighborhoods and their ability to exert control within neighborhoods. So it aligns much with that Chicago school perspective. Um, but as we talk about in the book, a lot of Jacobs ideas don't align with that initial interpretation. So to give you a little bit of context, uh, the neighborhood that we were studying, I was called Walnut Hills in Cincinnati, um, they got a new director at the nonprofit redevelopment foundation and took a very place based approach to try and change the neighborhood. Uh, for many decades, it had been a very high crime neighborhood with a lot of boarded up buildings, vacant buildings, various crime problems. And he took a place-based approach to try and get government grants and to get property developers to come in and focus on a very small three-quarter mile corridor um, and redeveloping the specific properties within that area to try and tr um, you know, improve upon the neighborhood. Very little was touched outside of this or in the residential areas that we saw. Um, and we also generally didn't see a lot of involvement of residents in this process, but over a very short period of time, we saw this neighborhood transform rapidly, as you can see in the photos to the right that I've taken. Um, these vibrant businesses that were attracting customers from all over the city, it became this really go-to neighborhood. And we also saw crime patterns decline quite rapidly. So as I mentioned, the traditional sort of uh, Chicago school explanation of the structural factors that we typically um, use to understand differences in crime across neighborhoods really didn't fit. Um, and we found that reading Jane Jacobs' Death and Life um, helped us understand this process. So in the book, we're gonna cut right to the chase and give you our sort of three core arguments of what we believe Jane Jacobs' work and these ideas can bring to criminology that we think uh, criminologists should embrace to help advance the field and our understanding of crime at places and in neighborhoods. So the first, uh, is a turning point from the focus of uh, residents as the main source of informal social control to place managers. So Jacobs very frequently talked about um, the influence of shopkeepers and property owners, business owners, that idea of you know, the individual standing outside of their shop, they're sweeping the street, they, they know the owners across the street, uh, maybe regulars in the neighborhood, the residents in the apartments above, and they have uh, a sense of control over this neighborhood. And by virtue of ownership of the places that they have, they have the power to control what happens there and sometimes even at nearby places. They also, different to residents, have this economic incentive to keep their places um, functioning well and keep them safe to attract customers to these particular areas. 
Um, place managers are largely absent from a lot of the neighborhood explanations that we see in criminology. Uh, and we argue that this shift or this turning point as Jacobs brings to the literature is that we should also focus on this very vital source of informal social control that has been uh, largely overlooked. So in that vein, when we think about the influence of property owners, the control that they have within these neighborhoods, the second turning point um, has to do with the creation of crime opportunities within neighborhoods. So while the Chicago School focuses a lot on this ecological perspective, they liken that neighborhood change and city growth um, to the idea of, you know, the plant ecology and invasion succession of various species. Well, Jacobs does not agree with this analogy at all. She argues that cities are more like farms. They're not this natural process that you have farmers who, you know, to use the analogy, they will plant carrots in one area, potatoes in another, and they pull weeds out of those places. There's nothing natural about these plots whatsoever. The farmers dictate what happens there. Well, she says cities are no different. Farmers in cities are essentially property owners, developers, governments, financial institutions who can dictate what does and doesn't happen in neighborhoods, what exists in these neighborhoods. And so in this section of the book, we've, we review the literature and urban history, which shows how a small number of these individuals, they're typically elites, and they are rarely actual residents of these neighborhoods, can actually have a great deal of influence and control over what happens in these places. So for example, restrictive covenants that are written into property deeds can dictate who can occupy properties, whether it's lease them, rent them, own them. And these were often driven by race to control who can live in what areas and who could not. Federal government lending policies, many of you have probably heard of redlining before, decided which areas received economic investments and which ones did not. Where would banks approve mortgages so that you could invest in improved neighborhoods versus not? Those were deliberate processes. Um, entire neighborhoods or sections of them could be torn down, as you see in the picture on the right here, tear them down to make way to build highways and interstates that, that move right through uh, particular cities. Urban renewal policies in the 1950s and 1960s, would governments would forcibly evict tens of thousands of people, often from poor neighborhoods. They would demolish buildings and then give that property over to private developers who would then come in and build new apartment buildings or businesses, right? So that movement of people was forced upon them to leave these areas. All of these actions and these processes were deliberate, as Jacobs argues. It was not a natural process. And so we go through um, that within the book, why that is important to embrace. So lastly, if these individuals um, possess this amount of control by virtue of ownership, we argue that the fundamental unit of analysis that we need to focus on are microspatial places. An owner can control his own property that he owns. And we also see that a lot of owners will purchase multiple properties, which then extends their control. Then these owners could also work with other owners who own multiple properties that creates a network of places. And then we can see these much larger or wider neighborhood effects. Um, so wider control or even lack thereof can often start at places. And we give examples of this. Many of you have probably seen examples of it with um, you know, Kate Bauer's crime radiators paper or the reverse of that, Clark and Weisberg's uh, diffusion of benefits idea that these, these issues in, of control can start at places and radiate outwards. Um, so all in all in this book, we argue that the Chicago School has provided a perspective in criminology that has guided a lot of the research we've done in terms of what questions do we ask? What people do we study? Uh, what methods do we use? How do we interpret our findings or the findings of other people? Um, and we, and the, the misinterpretation of Jane Jacobs' work using this lens is an example of this. Um, and we wanted to bring to criminology uh, a correction of what Jane Jacobs really talks about. And we offer what we refer to as a neo-Jacobian perspective. So it's a new way to look at neighborhoods, which we believe will open up a host of new uh, research questions, groups of people to study and methods to use that we believe will help advance criminology and our understanding of uh, neighborhoods. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this all comes from work that we just finished up a draft of a book outlining all of these ideas. Um, it's been contracted by Cambridge University Press for their new Elements in Criminology series. The first in that series was just released uh, last month. Uh, it's currently under review and slated for release uh, next year. We're very excited about it. Hope other people will be as well. Um, we have certainly throughout this process um, adopted a new perspective and way of looking at the world and we're hoping we can get other people to 
put on a new set of glasses and see the world a little differently too. And uh, hopefully you'll be interested in picking up our book and maybe in the meantime, reading Jacob's work as well. So thank you. Thank you and congratulations on the book. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so we have time for questions. Um, one did come in. Um, um, and so uh, Natalie had answered it in the Q&A, but I, I would like to do it, it live as well, just for people listening um, or who may uh, find this um, on our YouTube page in a, in a few weeks. Um, and so the, the question was, um, again, for Natalie, does the height correspond to income? Um, for example, do the wealthy live higher? Um, Natalie, if you want to um, speak to that a little bit just on the live stream for people. Sure. Um, as I mentioned in the in the chat, there's some evidence to suggest that the homes that are at higher elevations um, have are of higher value. Um, there's different advantages for living or residing at higher elevations, such as uh, being less susceptible to flooding and the effects of natural disasters and things like that. So um, to control for that in my study, I made sure to hold constant um, the mean household, uh, sorry, the median household value. Um, in my study to make sure that that wasn't an influencing factor aside from slope and elevation. Thank you. Um, another question just came in for you. Um, do you believe that crime by slope would be more direct when looking at a suburban area uh, rather than an urban one? I'm not sure what you mean um, by more direct. Do you mind clarifying the question? Um, so we'll give, we'll give Hannah, uh, this is a question from Hannah Perry. So Hannah, if you could Follow up in the in the Q and A box for us, please. We'd appreciate that. A little waiting game of online conferences. Um, so Hannah writes uh, more of a direct correlation, as there does not seem to be a strong correlation in San Francisco, from her understanding. So a stronger relationship is what you're asking. So we'll we'll let um, Hannah and, uh, and Natalie kind of communicate um, back okay. and forth to kind of clear up what um, what we're talking about here. Um, uh, a question came in for you, Shannon. Um, a couple of questions first. So uh, people are asking for the the title of the the Jane Jacobs book one more time. Uh, yes. Can you all hear me? You can hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Whose Eyes on the Street Control Crime at Places and in Neighborhoods? New Answers from Jane Jacobs. So if, if anyone is interested, if you just Google Cambridge Elements in Criminology, you should get the search result that has, there's a whole web page that's going to, it starts showing the various books within the series that uh, ours will be hopefully appearing soon once we get through the review process. Um, another question for you, Shannon. Um, do you think property owner place management will differ or vary by micro places that residential, commercial, or mixed use? Can you repeat the question? Um, yeah. Um, do you think property owner place management will differ by micro places that residential, commercial, or mixed use. Um, it's in the it's in the Q and A box if you wanna if you wanna read it. Maybe Sorry, I'm not. Just, you want me to try it? Yeah. Sure. I mean, it have to. I mean, it's it's we have to stop thinking of place management like guardianship. Uh, if you go once stores open again and you can go out and see how these things work you'll see place management at work at a grocery store. It's very different from place management at a bar. Um, it's how those places operate. I mean, it's, it's one of those uh, things of life that is so obvious that we've overlooked it in criminology. Um, so the real question is how, a bar, how bar management differs across bars or how grocery store management across grocery stores, because you can't manage a parking garage in the same way you would ma manage a movie theater. Um, 
maybe in business 101, you get some general principles, but after that, it's, it's going to be very, very different. Um, so, yeah. and, and sorry that I was able to read the question now, mm -hmm. just in understanding of, I think what they're looking yeah. at to you is, yeah, the place managers are interested in the overall functioning of their place and each place might serve a different function. And so they might operate it differently and the same as different crime opportunities could be present at one place versus another, that they would tailor different management approaches and decisions at those places. Thank you. Um, so we have time for one more question. Um, uh, so um, for you, Natalie, um, in terms of victims by gender, uh, they write, so females tend to live in higher elevations. Um, I think just asking for um, a little bit of clarification on, on the role of gender in your, in your work. That's interesting that you brought that up. I don't have gender specifically as a variable that I'm looking at in my particular study uh, because I can see elevation in terms of the physical terrain, but not necessarily you know, high, how, how high up into a structure or a building the, the incident occurred because typically the, when the residential burglaries happen, it's on the bottom floor of a building. Um, but that would be interesting to analyze in the future, uh, the influence of gender and altitude. Elevation within elevation. Elevation, yeah. <laughs> Um, awesome. So uh, we're out of time. Um, so I just want to say thanks again to all of our um, panelists for, for taking time to be with us today. Um, and congratulations on all of your incredible work. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for coming out this afternoon. I know Friday um, is, is not the optimal time for Zoom stuff. Um, so all of us at CrimCon appreciate your um, participation. Um, hey, if you plan on sticking around for the next session um, on the same theme, I have to close down the webinar um, for recording purposes. So this will be live again in approximately 10 minutes. Um, thanks again, everybody, for coming out. Thank you all.